Thanks. Uh, so as Scott mentioned, I have a company called Small Potatoes, and uh, what I've done through the years is kind of help small and growing food companies to grow their business. So one of the things that I've done is farmer's market management. So for folks who maybe have two or three markets that they're running already and they need a weekend off, uh, they could bring me in or some members of my team. Or if they were looking to expand, uh, maybe you've got more markets than you're able to do, uh, you could hire our team to go in and, and run market booths for you. Uh, so I have personally worked markets all over upstate New York although I recently re relocated to blistering hot Daytona Beach, Florida, where I'll be coming fr uh, from today. Uh, but I've done markets uh, all over the country. I travel to give uh, workshops like this, and so wherever I go to a town, if I'm able, I'll set up for a day and do a farmer's market booth with companies that I've worked with. Uh, so I've worked selling produce and dried goods, uh, a little bit of everything. Most everything that you guys that I've got on this list here, folks, or stuff that you're selling, I have some familiarity with. Um, I imagine that you guys all have questions that are really specific to your booth and uh, and to your products, and so we will get to those as we go. Uh, I do like to wait just so we're at the end of the slide, just because it's uh, because we got a little distance between us. It's hard for me to, to keep up if uh, if you guys are raising your hand. When I have the slideshow up and running. I won't actually see you guys in the classroom. So that's why I want to make sure we stop at the end of every slide. You guys can ask any questions that you have, uh, and we'll go from there. Uh, I will say that I, I, you guys have a real diverse amount of products, so I do hope that I get really specific questions when it comes to some of the display building stuff. Uh, and I hope I can answer some questions about meat. That's always a tough one. How do you display meat at the market? Uh, but hopefully we have some good strategies, and then maybe you guys will be able to share stuff that works for you, too. Um, I find that these oftentimes, you know, I'll bring some information that you need, but also, you know, the other folks that are in the classroom are going to be able to share their experiences and maybe uh, come up with some stuff I haven't come across in the five, six years I've been doing this. Uh, and, and so I really want to make sure that you guys are, are engaging with it as well. Uh, so for me, I first got into, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to actually the metrics of the, in the, the slide shown in a second, but, you know, for me, I used to approach the market, I would help these little companies by trying to get into stores. And so we worked real hard going town to town and store to store making pitches. And what I ended up learning as I went and from going to all these different towns, that as the shop local movement has grown and the eat local movement has grown, more and more of the smart, dedicated, eat local buyers were going to the farmer's market first. And then beyond that, also the really great retailers and chefs were going to the farmer's market first as well. So when I, when I first started this business, we approached breaking into the market as going to grocery stores, trying to sell wholesale, and we've completely shifted to, we, we try to help everybody, just about everybody, sometimes it's not the right fit, but just about everybody, to break into the market through the farmer's market. So for me, I think that the, the farmer's markets are kind of the great business incubator for the food system. You can try out new products for those of you who haven't started the markets yet, uh, and you can make some mistakes at the market. You know, you can change your price if, as you're trying to figure out what you can do. The, the farmer's market tends to be a little bit more forgiving than, say, a wholesale market, where if you change your price every couple of weeks, they're going to be you know, hassling you about it. Um, so for me, I really think every food producer should be starting at the farmer's market. Uh, and, and we're going to start with some really basic stuff about how to run a great booth. And then we'll eventually we'll get into some display building and some things like that. So to get started, and I know there's probably a couple of people already that are like, oh boy, I know how to give great customer service. But we're going to go over some really basic tips. Uh, you know, we've got some new folks at the market as well. So most people are kind of programmed to say no. You know, we all do this. Like we run into the grocery store and there's somebody out there giving out little cups of orange juice or little fried sausages or something, and all you want to do is run in, grab a gallon of milk, and get out of there. And they're, and they're like, hey, hey, sample, sample. So we're all conditioned to say no. So we're going to do some really easy things to kind of help lower people's barriers and get them interested in coming to talk to you. So one of the very first things is simply making eye contact with somebody as they walk by your booth or walk up to your booth. 
if you make eye contact with somebody and they clearly aren't interested, they look away, they walk in the other direction, no need to call over to them, hey, we've got samples, hey, come and check out my booth. Eye contact is a really easy way just to engage a customer that's kind of uh, low impact, and you can tell right away if somebody is interested or not. Uh, one of the easy ways to, to make good eye contact is simply being on your feet at the market. Uh, this one could be kind of tough, and I know, you know, especially for farmers and stuff, you guys maybe are out in the field at 4 a.m. picking before you go to the market, and you're on your feet all, you know, all week. Being on your feet at the market is very important, too. Uh, if you are sitting down behind your booth, it's very hard to make eye contact with people and to be engaging. Uh, for my, the folks that work at my, my market booth, uh, part of the requirement of the job is that you need to be able to be on your feet for eight hours. And we typically don't provide chairs. Uh, we don't even bring them. We just tell people, you know, you need to be ready to be on your feet. Now, that being said, uh, the, I did um, a summer of farmer's markets in Manhattan and Brooklyn about four years ago. And the day before I started, about a week before I started the markets, I actually sprained my ankle really badly and I drive a stick shift. So I would drive from Syracuse, New York, to New York City and back every weekend in a stick shift with a blown out ankle, and I still made sure that I was on my feet every day at the market because I think it's that important to, good, to, the, to basic good customer service. Um, so beyond that, you're, you're standing up, you make eye contact with them. Uh, it's obvious that you know, they smile at you, they make eye contact back. It's simply just saying hello. Uh, or whatever greeting catches your fancy. You say it a million times, so whatever you're comfortable with. But here you've taken a couple of steps to kind of lower people's barrier to telling you no or to, to you know, be standoffish or whatever it is. Just making eye contact and saying hello will increase the number of people that come over to your booth. Now, once they get over to your booth, you want to start chatting them up a little bit. And so probing questions is a way that, that you can do that. So a probing question is finding out what brought somebody to the market. Uh, especially if you're new to the market and you don't know the customers yet, uh, this is a great way to say, hey, you know, do you come every week? Uh, you know, are, a lot of people are new to the farmer's market as well, um, especially if you see young parents with, with kids. Going to the farmer's market is often a lifestyle change that people are making when they start having children for the first time. So ask them what brought them to the market. Oh, oh, I just came to buy some stuff for dinner. What are you making for dinner? That's a great probing question, too. Uh, just to find out a little bit more about your customer, uh, what brought them in. If they tell you that they're making something that your product pairs well with, that's great. That's an opportunity for you to actually sell them something. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, if you start seeing the same people every week and they haven't come up to your booth, hey, I thought you've come by every week and this is the first time you stopped by, what made you stop today? Uh, little things like that really help. Uh, and a lot of folks, there's a movement towards kind of a relationship-based economy, and that's another thing that's driving people to the farmer's markets is they want to know who's producing their food, who's growing their food. And so they want to have some of this interaction with people. You know, they may start asking you probing questions about your growing practices or how big your farm is or, you know, has it been in the family for a long time. So, you know, try to find ways to engage your customers in conversation that is, that is real and helps you to kind of build a long-term relationship. So uh, a lot of this I tell people, you know, you're in it to win it for the long term. There may be people that come to the market every weekend for two months before they stop at your booth. Uh, but that may end up happening as they spend the next two years coming to your booth. So be patient. You know, if you don't have a good week for the first couple of weeks, that doesn't mean the second half of the season is not going to pick up for you. Uh, just continually try to find ways to be friendly, engage your customers, and start with really low-impact stuff like just simply making eye contact. Um, so before we go to the next one, I was wondering if anybody has questions that they, I know we, anybody who works the market has a wrap that they give all the time. I could tell you about Better Brittle in my sleep. I've sold it so many times. Uh, do you guys have any great probing questions, questions that you feel like have helped you to get to know your customer that you want to share with the group? All right. Well, it's good that you guys came to this workshop then, right? All right. So the next uh, big part of good customer service is signage. 
good, clear signage. So one of the examples I, I like to use for now, here's a picture of a good sign that is a bad picture. Uh, but the, the key to it is simplicity. So all we have on this picture that we're looking at is the name of the product that criminates this kind of mushroom and that it's $5 a pound. Anything beyond that can get to be too much. So you want to make sure that it is simple and legible from a big distance. So I always I make my signs, and then I step as far away as I think people will be trying to read those signs. Uh, I know there's some people out there, and I heard this at the last time I gave this workshop for the first time kind of a lot, was that people don't put signs up at all in order to try and engage their customer. But what I found is, you know, if you're having a conversation with one customer, they're, they're getting to know who you are, they're getting to know your product a little bit, and then somebody else comes up and wants to buy something, they may simply grab the thing that they want, take out the money, the exact change, because they've seen the sign, and then when you see something like that happen, you can excuse yourself, hey, I'll be right back. You can turn to the person who has already gotten what they need because you have a good, easy-to-read sign, uh, collect their money, and then go back to the first person. Uh, it, it's a big thing is it being legible from a few feet away. Uh, something I see people do that they're trying to brighten up the booth, and we're going to talk about color and things that you can do to, to make your booth look nice. They'll, they'll write a sign in a bright color, uh, bright yellow or bright red, and it actually makes it more difficult for people to read. So you want to make sure that it's clear. If it's a dark background, white print. If it's a white background, black print and use up as big a space as possible. Signs can be, they don't have to be really fancy. You can print them at home. You can hand write them. I hand write a lot of my signs just on pieces of cardboard that I've trimmed so that they look clean on the edges. Uh, one difficulty that sometimes people have is actually getting the signs to stand up. Uh, one of the things I like to do is I'll take uh, the piece of cardboard and I just tape a popsicle stick on the back. I get it at Michael's Craft. There, you, know, you get a box of 100 for like 4 bucks, And I just put a piece of tape on the back with it, and then I stick it into a piece of product that maybe was dinged, you know, an apple that's got a couple nicks in it that's not going to sell anyway. Or it, it, you can see in the back of this one, it's just sitting in the back of a basket. Um, but make sure that it is standing up and that it's easy to read for people. Um, does anybody have questions about signage? Do they have signs that they really like? Yeah. What was the uh, fabric that was used to surround the mushrooms there? What was the fabric that was used to surround the mushrooms? It's uh, it's just like a pillowcase. Um, and so we, we'll get into that a little bit more, but but along those lines, any kind of fabric to cover your, your booth uh, works. So when I give this workshop live, we actually do a, we build a display right in the classroom. And all of the materials we use are simply things I found around the house. So I have a, I found one time a canvas shower curtain in the package. It had not been showered with, uh, but just opened it up, and then that became a table covering. Uh, a sheet, a blanket, a straight pieces of fabric. Again, you can go to the craft store and just buy bolts of fabric. You can just buy pieces of fabric pretty cheaply. Uh, coffee shops. Uh, places that roast their own coffee will have burlap bags. Um, my favorite, then we're going to show it, I'll show it a little later, is I will just cover my table with butcher paper, just brown paper, unroll it, tape it down, and then at the end of the market I just rip it off and recycle it. Um, it makes for a really small and easy to carry display, uh, but we'll, we'll actually look at pictures of that one. But the other thing, and, and it's probably what drew your eye to it, is when you are picking a fabric, if you're not just finding stuff around the house, like I sometimes do, a color that makes the product jump out is really important. So I think that this blue with these mushrooms does a nice job in that it really makes the, the mushrooms jump out. Um, so black is really good for that, although it does it, it might capture a little bit of dust depending on what kind of market you're in. But really, any kind of uh, fabric will do as long as it's clean and it's dedicated use. So I mentioned the shower curtain. Please don't bring your shower curtain from home. Buy a new one and use it just for that, um, or a blanket or a flag or whatever it might be. But a single plain color, sorry, didn't mean to give you my, my head there. A single plain color that helps to really show off, that kind of balances out and shows off the, the uh, product is important. Any others? 
right, we'll move on to the next one. And this is a, a simple one. Uh, I have actually added it this time because I had a bunch of people asking questions. Simple cash handling. We're not going to talk about counting out change or anything like that. Uh, but bringing change, this is something that I made the mistake of, of doing my first couple times at the market. Your market's 6, 7 a.m. on a Saturday, and you don't think to get changed the day before. Uh, happens to everybody. I usually bring, it depending on the market, if I have a market with 15 or 20 vendors, I'm probably bringing 100 to 150 maybe in change, ones and fives. Uh, when I would go to New York City every weekend, when we did a market in Brooklyn, I brought $250 in ones and fives every single week, and, uh, and there was a couple of occasions where I ran out. So it, it can happen. But just make sure that you have a game plan and that you go through the same steps every week. Um, accepting credit cards is getting to be a bigger and bigger deal, although it is very easy to do now. So I use a program called SquareUp. It's free for an account, and it works on any smartphone. Uh, you don't have to have Wi-Fi so long as you have some Internet connection. Uh, and I just take a credit card payment. I believe it's a quarter per transaction, and then they take a small fee on top of that. Um, I'm not a shill for Square Up. I just know that it's worked for me through the years. One of the other nice things that they've added is invoicing. So now if you have a wholesale account, you can also invoice through your Square Up, and all your payment will happen in one place. Uh, customers will spend more with you if they're able to use a credit card. That, is, uh, that was the first thing I found was as soon as I started doing it, my average sales went from like $15 a transaction to 20 And it, it happened instantly. People will buy more if they can give you credit cards. Uh, one of the other really important things about cash handling, and every market's different, but markets attract pickpockets. And Sometimes people are like, oh, well, they're there to, to you know, pickpocket the customers. They're actually, if pickpockets come to a market, they're there to steal from the farmers and the producers. And it stinks to think that that happens, but I've seen it happen a bunch of places. So a lot of folks will bring a cash box and leave it on the table near them. I recommend always keeping your money on your person. And so what, uh, what I do is I, get, I have an apron. So I made this one. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. This is the back part of a pair of jeans. And it's just got two pockets in it so we can keep the cash. Uh, I keep all the fives and quarters in one pocket. I'm sorry, the, the ones and quarters in one pocket, fives and tens in the other. Anytime somebody gives me a 20, it goes right into my jeans. It goes right into my proper pocket and is not coming back out of there. Um, I have heard of on more than one market that I've worked at, where somebody just walked up, grabbed the cash box, and walked away. Keep your money on you. Uh, it is very important. There's nothing worse than going and busting your butt all day long and then losing every penny of it. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so one of the other, it's, again, it's a, it's a really simple thing, and I picked this up from another farmer, is making a list of all of the things that you need and keeping all of your things, the, the items that you use at the market organized. So I carry, I use like a Rubbermaid tote. So anything that I'm going to need to have at the market every week, I keep in this tote. I have a list. This is the list that I use for one of mine. It's just on a piece of cardboard, handwritten on there, nothing fancy. Um, I've seen a number of people that have started to actually tape the list on the inside of their tote. And so every week as they're getting prepared for market, say Thursday, they'll go through and run through an inventory very quickly. So these are some of the really simple things, tables and table coverings, obvious, obviously, shelves, baskets, boxes, whatever it is that you're using to build the displays. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, signage, I like to have my signage made in advance, um, you know, especially with farmers and veggies and fruits, the products will change every week. Um, so you might have to make new signs every week. You may change your prices. You know, if you get halfway through a season, then all of a sudden the tomato blight hits real badly and the price of tomatoes goes up. You know, I just make them in advance. Uh, this apron, this money belt that I have, uh, a lot of people will go to a hardware store and get like a carpenter belt, uh, go to a restaurant supply and get a server's uh, apron. Just something where the money is right on, on your body change we talked about, the sampling materials. We're going to talk a little bit about sampling, but generally 
uh, for sampling materials. It's everything you would need to serve, plus extras in case anything falls on the ground. So you want to have redundancies, tongs especially. I always bring five sets of tongs. And then also whatever it would take to keep the area clean. This is a big one. And, and I might have told this, this story in, in a previous workshop. Uh, sorry if you heard it already. But I was at the market one week, and I had just gotten started, and I was working with a salsa company. And a fella came up. It's 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. It's a big Syracuse market. And I'm still setting up my booths. And I've got all my samples laid out. And a fella comes up, and he says, how hot is this hot salsa? And I told him, and I still believe it to be true to this day, it's the hottest jarred salsa I have ever had in my whole life. And so the guy just grabbed a chip, scooped it up, jammed it in his mouth, and it was way too hot for him. He immediately spit it out. It ran all down the front of his white shirt, and he was hooting and hollering in the front of my booth. And all I needed to help him out was a towel or a paper towel or something to clean him up. And so rather than him making a mess and me being able to clean it immediately and sending him on his way, I had a guy hooting and hollering with salsa all over the front of him at the front of my booth before the day it even got started. So make sure that you can keep your area clean and also help your customers out to keep them clean. The, the wet wipes, uh, I use those. Hand sanitizer uh, for customers or yourself. You're going to be handling a lot of cash and a lot of uh, you know vegetables and stuff like that. Some people will, will uh, bring gloves and change their gloves really regularly. Um, you know, your, your market manager typically can give you good tips on how to, how to sample out. Uh, and when we get to sampling, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more in depth. Uh, coolers, that's a, that's a big one too. If you have product that you need to keep cool. Uh, I use a restaurant bag. I, it's a soft-sided cooler. Um, I got it from Restaurant Depot. It was like $60. It's, it's actually for catering. And so it is completely soft-sided. And it holds, and I'll, I'll take two liters of, you know, just empty two-liter bottles, empty gallon bottles, fill them with water, keep them in the freezer, and then those are my ice for the day. And so as it thaws, it'll uh, keep the bag cool. And I've actually been able to so store, like, pickles and things like that up to three days uh, without issue in one of those, those uh, catering coolers. They're a lot cheaper than hard-sided, and they take up way less space. Um, I tend I work out of a hatchback and sometimes have to drive great distance. So for me, everything that I do has to be small and if it can help it to get a little smaller. Uh, another thing I have on here is just bags. I know some people that they just won't provide uh, shopping bags at all. Uh, I bring shopping bags. I buy the biodegradable ones online so that people can feel a little better about them. Um, and then also a great secondary product to sell is tote bags. There's a company called Chico Bag that makes these bags that fold up into a little ball that people can like keep in their purse or uh, even up in their pocket. Uh, but just having bags available to people is also going to encourage them to buy more. Um, and, and whenever you can help it, try to do something that's a little bit more sustainable. People appreciate that. Either selling a reusable bag. Um, if, you, if you do sell reusable bags, it gives you an opportunity to reward repeat customers too. Like, wow, you've been here. Every, every Saturday this month you've been here, have one of our tote bags. Um, or to do a promotion, anybody who comes to visit us this week, it's a dollar off the tote bag. But it's, it's a way that you can kind of drive a little bit of extra sales by having your own either printed or not printed. They don't have to be if uh, you didn't want to send the extra. Um, so these are just some of the things that end up making it on my list uh, every week. So that, you know, things that I might have to buy regularly, the sampling supplies. Uh, rubber gloves, anything like that. Um, but the, the important part is all of this stuff is packed into a tote. And so at the end of every week, everything goes back into the tote. I can inventory the tote, and then it comes back with me. I see a lot of folks that just throw all the materials in the back of their truck or in the back seat of their car. Keep them organized, and it'll save you a lot of time over the course of the week, and you're much less likely to run out of things. Um, does anybody have things that they always bring to the market that they found to be really handy? Duct tape, I know that's one. Yeah. Is it, could you add on to that list, and is it a good idea to have them, your business cards? 
Could you have, should you yes. have business cards? Should you? Uh, the bi business cards? Yeah. I always bring a stack of them, and we'll talk a little bit about promotional materials later, but always bring your business cards. It's the, the most important uh, piece of marketing material that you're going to have is your business card. Um, and I'm only, I always tell people, you know, for every card you give out, you should be getting one back. Uh, a lot of folks don't follow through. You are always going to follow through. You're going to grab those cards and you're going to call those people. But I don't know. I mean, that was a lesson I learned when I first got started, too, is I would just give my business card out and be like, people like me. They're going to call me. Uh, they might not. <laughs> so make sure that you're collecting business cards. If you're handing a business card out, you're trying to get one back as well. And then you're going to follow up with them regardless if they follow up with you. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the marketing materials part. All right, so selling. This is a big piece of it. I, I used to shy away from the idea of, oh, we're going to try and sell people stuff. We're just going to go with these great products we have and people are going to come up to us. But there are subtle little things that you can do to sell product, to, to upsell, uh, and to get people to buy just a little bit more. Um, and then also we're going to talk a little bit about getting wholesale accounts at the market because I think that's a really important place to, to do that kind of thing. So the first thing about selling and upselling is sampling. And so Peggy, I think you see I think you see your name right here. Talk to your market manager to see what is allowed. Uh, the state has guidelines, but also every market is going to have a different idea of what they can and can't do. So you'll see there's a picture of me to the right doing it wrong. This is something, now the only reason this is happening, that the woman is actually putting her hand into a jar of pickles, is because it's the last pickle in the jar and that's going in the garbage after that. So the, the most important thing is to keep the area clean, to have clean spoons and tongs and lids, as well as anything that you can have to, to do cleanup. Some markets will make you cover any samples that you're giving out. So you might have to have like a little dome. Uh, some places it's wide open. Some places you can prepare food to give out as a sample, not necessarily to sell it, but you can have something that's prepared. Uh, so again, the, the most important part is to talk to the market manager that you're working with to see what their standards are for their market. What are they going to allow? And that being said, I would love to have Peggy tell us what the sampling, what, how, what, what are people allowed to do to sample at, uh, is it Dunkirk? It's a Dunkirk market. Well, it's a little unfair because it's our first year. Last year was our first year under a uh, state contract. So it was a learning process, but I can see that sampling is one of the things that is necessary, but it's kind of a double-edged sword. You have to do it cautiously. And cleanly, I guess, is probably the biggest issue. So you had a little trouble here, and it sounds like that you, you just have started. Uh, and so, yeah, Scott, if you could repeat that back for me. Yeah, Marty said that the market just started last year, and mm -hmm. she, you know, said that uh, it was kind of been a bit of a double-edged sword between with sampling, yeah. with sampling to either like provide it, but also do it. You know, according to, I'll say, like local health health codes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, so then, that being the case, is uh, thank you, thank you. So if if you're just starting to develop that policy, what I would suggest is make a policy. So start with, uh, you know, the Department of Ag, and and the, the, usually it's not the Department of Health that you have to talk to. Sometimes they get involved, but whoever you are talking to to help you set up this market, that's a regulatory agency. Just say, hey, what do you guys recommend for sampling policy? Does it need to be covered? Uh, does it need to be only raw, like it can't be prepared? It could be stuff like you open a jar that you put out. Uh, some places will let you like cut a carrot, and then some places will say you can't. So just just come up with something, and I think that you're, you're, as, you, as the market grows since it's new, uh, by having those policies available to folks, that you've written out something and said, hey, this is how it works. You can do it. You need to make sure that everything is clean, that you have sanitizer available, that you have paper towels or regular towels. I love bringing real towels when I can help it. Um, and whatever it is, just let them know and write it all down. And so that way, there's some uniformity 
Um, all the folks at the market are kind of doing the same thing. Now, some of you guys are going to have a little, like, fruits and veggies can be a difficult thing to, to sample out. Uh, it, depending on, again, depending on the market you go to. Some markets will let you actually prepare food in a, kit, in a, in a certified kitchen to give samples out. A lot of them don't. Some of them I've seen people actually bring like a little skillet and just cook up little meatballs or little pieces of, of bacon or whatever it is and give samples out. Find out what your market's going to allow. Uh, you, know, you know, I tell people to look at the Ag and Markets website, but honestly, every county is, is implementing those things differently. So if your market manager, if it's a new market and the market manager hasn't come up with anything, maybe that's something you can help out check in with Ag and Markets and say, how are we allowed, we're working at a farmer's market, we'd like to get samples, what do I have to know? Um, but as a general best practice, no matter what market you go to, keep it clean, bring extra serving supplies, and probably cover the stuff. I mean, that's, that's usually a pretty good, it's just those little plastic domes you can order online, you can get at restaurant supply. Most of the stuff we'll be looking at, you can order through restaurant supply. Uh, and we're going to look at some uh, some booths, and we'll actually see some good sampling. So the key to this one is this picture that I'm showing you, don't ever do that. That is not the way to do it unless you are going to throw that whole thing out. Uh, one of the struggles that I've had is, again, with the salsa and, and worked with some chutneys and some other where you would dip, uh, is little kids would come up and just stick their hand in the bowl. Just the whole, just, ah, we're going to touch all of them. I throw it all out. A, a little kid, you know, comes up, wipes his face, and then touches your chip. They can all just go right in the garbage. It's okay. I don't make a big deal out of it. I just as soon as they walk away, I grab it, I throw it out. I get something fresh. Having the dome over the top or some sort of a covering really helps. Um, another way that you can avoid that sort of thing is actually uh, serve it to people. Keep all the samples behind the table. And so when people come up to your booth, you can ask them, would you like a sample, and then actually serve it to them. That's the safest and the, and the best way. Um, I've usually done where I give people access to the samples because I might be sampling out 12 or 15 products at a time. Uh, and so that way, it, people, a lot of people can come up and eat. Uh, sampling is probably the most important selling tool that you're going to have. People want to taste what it is that you've got. Uh, vegetables and meat, again, that's going to be a little bit more difficult with that, so see what people are able to do. Um, but for places that will actually allow you a little uh, little hot plate to cook some meat, boy, people will flock to your booth if they smell meat cooking. Uh, you know, the, the smell of bacon will get, up, get anybody up out of bed. It'll certainly bring them over to your booth, uh, uh, you know, the days that you're working. The other thing is to, to mix it up. Don't have the same sample out every week. If you can help it, sample something different every week. If you only have one kind of product that you sell, which is pretty common, try and find different ways to serve it every week. All right. Do you guys have any questions about sampling, or do you have some things that you've found that are creative ways for you to put samples out that you thought have really worked? Have you ever... Can you hear me? Have you ever been at a place where there is just a food sampling booth where every vendor could enter their product for tasting rather than having it tasted at their own? If I if I heard you correctly, it would yes. If there was if I've ever been to markets where there was one booth where all the sampling happened at one booth, and so all the vendors could give samples to that booth. To, is that right? Exactly. Yeah, um, I, I've seen that in a couple places. I saw that in Austin, Texas. That's how they did it because that was the regulation that the, the Department of Ag gave to them was you had to have the certified food handler doing that. So they, had, they would have one booth and somebody would actually prepare some dishes. The struggle, and so I asked them about it while I was there, uh, one of the things they said to me was that they struggled to be able to present every farmer to, or every producer of, of any kind of goods. So when they started, they tried to get all 40 farms and, and products on the table at one time, and it didn't work. And so what they've ended up doing is every vendor gets like one week 
and the products might be it might be like two or three producers at the same time and uh, excuse me um, so they'll have one one person that's actually preparing some food right there and giving some samples out they're a certified food handler and uh, they only showcase two or three farms at a time uh, but the nice thing is that usually there was something else going on at the booth too. So that the certified food handler might be a chef, and they might be buying products from the farms that were there. So it was like promoting the farm, or it was promoting the restaurant that was also buying wholesale from these food producers. Um, there was one that would do it that they would always, every week they would have a nonprofit or a charity doing the, the sampling out. So people would come over, they would give the pitch about, oh, this is kombucha from such and such uh, food producer, and these strawberries are in season from, from Joe's Strawberry Field. We're also here talking to you about wa like clean water or whatever it might be. Um, the, the producers at that market told me they didn't get a lot of bang for their buck. They didn't feel like they got as much out of the sampling experience but I felt like that was mostly people that would be good at sampling themselves. Some people, they're not totally sure how to sample their product out. You know, maybe they're not going to represent it in the best way. So for them, it was good to have a third party take care of it. And then for other people, they were like, ah, I didn't really get that much out of it because I would have been better at it. Um, so there, there's pros and cons to both. Um, if, you, if you do go that way, I would just suggest like making sure whoever is running that section is really outgoing and energetic, uh, has a really good idea of what, what it is they're trying to get done, whether it be promote the farmers, promote the third party project, um, and isn't just there, say, promoting their restaurant, like they really are promoting the farms. Um, but yeah, if you, if you do have a dedicated person at it, just make sure that they are the best they could be and that they are really engaging about whose products are on the table. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any others? All right. We'll, we'll move on to the next. Um, so upselling. This is always this is a, a tough word for me to kind of get used to using when I was selling too. But upselling essentially means trying to get people to buy one more product. So before I worked in farmers markets and, and with small food producers, I worked in a small independent grocery store. And every grocery store, you know, they have a million different metrics they can look at for margin and sales growth. But at the end of the day, the one place that they're always trying to impact their business is average transaction size. They call it average basket size. So trying to get people to buy one more thing. And that's why every grocery store has an aisle with 99 cent, you know, as you're checking out, you're surrounded by 99 cent items because they want you to grab one or two of those things. So upselling can be making um, products available to people that kind of pair well together. So for instance, if you are a cheese maker, although I think that's one of the very few things that many of you guys were doing, but uh, we'll use example. So it's, uh, you sell mozzarella, and you've got a neighbor that's selling tomatoes and basil. An upsell might be having some tomatoes and some basil on your table and suggesting to people, hey, I saw you're buying some mozzarella, or you're buying two balls of mozzarella today. You know, we're also making tomatoes available today. Or it might just be saying, you know, two booths down is my neighbor, and he makes the best tomatoes or he grows the best tomatoes, you know, that's what I pair mine with. Um, soup mixes, so uh, I see jams and jellies is on our list, and I see bread. I, I don't know if they were from the same folks, but if they aren't, this is an opportunity to kind of cross-sell. Uh, you guys are both at the market, or maybe you're at different markets, is actually selling each other's things as a way to encourage people to buy more. So in an instance with cross-selling, uh, there's lots of different arrangements. Some people will just you know, you're, you're the jam jelly seller. You've got a baker that makes crackers. If you sell the crackers for them, they get the full $5 or whatever they cost. Other people might say, hey, for every box of crackers you sell, I'll give you a buck. 
but it's a, it's a way to encourage people to buy a little something extra um, to, to get things together that they can do. Another way grocery stores do this, and I've started to see farmers do it, is by bundling items in a bag that can be made into a meal. So Wegmans has, has been the king of this. Is they, you can go into a Wegmans and they'll have the stir-fry mix, the salad mix, the sprout mix, the you know 50 different kinds of mixes where you buy one bag, you throw it in your cart, you get home, it's pre-washed and cut or whatever, you throw it in the frying pan and you're ready to go. People are buying like a dollar or a dollar twenty-five's worth of vegetables and paying four or five dollars because they're bundled together. So I don't typically suggest to farmers that you wash and cut and trim them. People are going to the farmers market; they understand that they're going to have a little more veg, like a little more processing. But to bundle those things together and today and say today we have a stir fry mix, uh, today we have a soup mix. Um, you know, pie mix, whatever it might be, is to actually bundle them all in a bag and sell it for a single price. And if you sell it for a single price, knock a little bit off. You don't have to, you know, come down 20% or anything like that, but maybe it's a dollar less if you're buying $15 worth of stuff all at once. This is something you'll need to experiment with a little bit to see what kind of things work for you, but it works for a lot of different people. If you're growing herbs, that's a really easy one uh, to bundle together. Um, what were some of the other things that we had here? You know, I, I saw wreaths and Christmas trees. If there's other items that are Christmas or stocking stuffers, those are nice things to bundle together. You know, hey, you're buying a Christmas tree. If you if you buy a Christmas tree, you can get a dollar, two dollars off of maple syrup. Um, so things like that. I'm looking at some of the the other items that we have. Oh, we saw caramel corn and and photo cards at the same booth. I would, I would, my one suggestion to you guys that jumped right into my mind is make sure you keep people's hands clean. So if they're sampling caramel corn, you don't want them to sample the caramel corn and then grab one of your photos. Um, I know that's backtracking a little bit to sampling, but uh, you know, finding ways to upsell. So concession stands, uh, an easy way to upsell might be putting like a chip display next to the register so when people are at the register they can actually just grab a bag of chips while they're there and, and that's an, uh, an easy way to upsell. Uh, uh, is there anything that you guys have done that you felt like was a, an effective way to get a customer to buy one additional item at your booth? All right. Um, this, is, this one's a little, it's a little tougher to figure out how to do it, but what I tell people is just to, to take a look at your table, you know, set up your booth, look at it, and think about what could be paired well together. You know, what are the, the things that I have here that I could sell together? Carrots, potatoes, and onions in a single bag is a really easy one, and you can call it soup stock, you can call it stir fry mix, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, people like the ease of, of being able to to grab those things. It's one of the ways that grocery stores got to be so ubiquitous is they made it easy for, for customers to plan a meal by having a bag. Um, beans, if, if any of you guys are selling beans, it's easy to make soup mixes. And, and if, you don't, if you feel like you don't have anything on your table that you're able to do that, think about stuff that your neighbors have and teaming up. So maybe you don't have it on the table, but you can make that recommendation down the way. We really like working with these folks send them down that way. Um, again, to go back to the idea of people really like the idea of like building a relationship at the market. They want to feel like they're, they're connecting to something. Uh, I've worked at enough farmers markets to know that behind the scenes, a lot of food producers don't get along. I think we've all probably had an experience where there was like some other vendor we really didn't like. Uh, but what I tell people is, you know, when you're behind the booth, it's kind of like theater. You're on stage. So you, lose, you leave all the nonsense behind and you just have really positive experiences with people. They want to think that all of the farmers at this farmer's market are great buddies. You're the best of friends. Uh, we know that's not true. <laughs> we know that that isn't anywhere near being true. But if you, know, if, you can, if you have people that you do like that you're working with, promote them. And it's going to promote you too. I know sometimes, you know, if, if you're like, people are looking for a specific kind of jam, 
you know, for some reason you're not making blueberry or whatever it is and you know people down the way do, don't hesitate to recommend them. I know it seems weird to send business to somebody else, but the truth is people will appreciate that. They think, you know, that in their mind you're such a good vendor that you want that customer to get exactly what they want, even if it means not buying it from you. Those people will come back to you because they had a good experience with you. So upselling, try and focus it on your own table. If it doesn't work on your table, send them to somebody who can help them, and those folks will come back to you. So this is a big one. I mentioned how I, I changed my approach through the years from going store to store to going to the farmer's markets first. Um, so I did markets in Rochester, Albany, Syracuse. They have some big markets. Um, I've done some smaller markets, Casanova and Westmoreland, that, that have 10, 12 vendors. Uh, there was one that I did. It was four vendors every week. Whatever the size of the market, always expect that somebody is going to come to that market that day that might be interested in buying wholesale from you. So that could be a grocery store, it could be a, a restaurant. Um, more and more, we're starting to see hospitals and some of these large community organizations going to the farmer's markets too. So just be ready for that. And by being ready, I, what I mean is to have a sample bag ready for them. So uh, again, I, I had dry goods. So I've sold pasta, coffee, and, and this, uh, candy were kind of the big three that I pitched at the markets. And so when somebody would come up to the market underneath the table, where I've got all my other things stashed behind the, the curtain or whatever, I have bags that have um, my sell sheet, which has all of the information about how to buy wholesale from me, all the pricing, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as well as samples and my business card. And if anyone at any point during our conversation says, I work at a restaurant, a grocery store, a, a kitchen of any kind, I just reach under the table, I have a bag for them, and I said, I'm so glad you're here, I actually have this for you. And I hand them a bag. So yes, I, I may be talking myself out of one sale at that point because maybe they were going to buy and now I just gave them one for free. But the long-term expectation being you might be able to get into their store. and. I, I do mean anybody. If a cashier comes up to me and says, oh, I run the register, it's Piggly Wiggly or whatever it is, I give them a sample bag. I understand that they're not the person that's going to make that choice, but I also know that this person's probably going to go and tell them. Um, so whenever I do that, I always ask a few questions about who they are, what they do. I get their card and follow up. Of course, I give them mine but I always get their card and information. And if they say, hey, you know, I'm just a clerk, I say, well, great, this is for you. Who is the buyer in your store? I would love to bring them a sample as well. Uh, so as an example, so New York obviously is a much larger market than other places that you guys are going to be selling. Uh, but that was kind of where we, we kind of broke in big and started working markets really heavily. So before we started doing farmer's markets in New York, I was making sales calls there. When I first started making sales calls, the first trip I took to New York City, I was a young man, full of hope and energy, ready to take on the Big Apple. I made 100 sales calls. That is 100 different stores that I visited to try to make a pitch in five days. It was intense. I was, I was at it morning, you know, from as early as I could till as late as I could. And at the first account that I went to, I made a sale. I thought, this is going to be great. We're going to, I'm going to take over the world. We're all going to make a million dollars. I got 98 consecutive no's after that, some of them much ruder than others. And then I got a sale at the end, and I think the guy just saw my broken spirit and was like, all right, we'll, we'll buy something from you. The next season, we started at the farmer's market. The first day that I was at the market, we got 18 wholesale accounts. Now, both of those numbers are kind of an extreme circumstance. I don't think that you're going to visit 100 stores and get sold 98 times, no. But I don't think you're going to get 18 wholesale accounts at the market. 
but just, you know, even if you got two or three, like think about how much time it takes to go to a store, make a pitch, find out who you got to talk to, you know, they're running late, you sit there for 20 or 30 minutes, as opposed to somebody actually coming up to you at the market and seeing people buying from you, and you can actually get multiple sales at one market without having to go anywhere while also earning money as you go, getting a whole, like always, always, always be prepared to get that wholesale account. If, uh, if Now, if you have farm fresh product and, and meat and things like that, obviously you're not going to have just a goodie bag prepared of that stuff. Make them one on the spot. Hey, you work at the market. If, if you're not willing to give away $20 worth of product or something like that, maybe you'll say, hey, since you work at the store, you know, if I'll give it to you for 50% off today if you want to give me the information about who the buyer is. But really make an effort at the wholesale market, at the, at the farmer's market, to get some wholesale accounts. Um, it's where all the smart buyers are going, and it's also where new buyers are going. Um, so an example of one that I had was a guy that came who worked in an institutional kitchen. He got the corporate edict came down to him that he had to start buying local. And so he just went to the farmer's market. He didn't know what else to do, so he came up to our booth, and he was like, I don't really know how it works. And so we were able to, to capture a, a, a really nice wholesale account um, because they they went to the farmer's market because they that was kind of the default to go to. Um, have any of you guys had experience getting wholesale accounts either with restaurants or uh, you know grocery stores or whatever at the farmer's market? Nobody yet? Yeah? Uh, what kind of account did you get? Well, was it a grocery store? It's just a... Uh it's a hell out market. It's, I've been selling in turkeys at Thanksgiving time, so it's just for uh, a small number and a uh, limited amount, but uh, it does work. But you, you guys like turkeys. Uh, so I, I heard turkeys, but I didn't catch most of the rest of that. It's a hell out market. Oh, it's, thank you. It, it's a hell out market. Uh, they're both at the huh. most. And he buys live uh, turkeys at Thanksgiving time from me. It seems to work. I just oh, that's great. Off. Have you been able to? So it was a halal market for the turkeys. Have you been able to grow it from there? Or is, is right now it's just the the Thanksgiving business? It's just the Thanksgiving business because his his market for turkeys is just a couple of weeks a year, and um, mm -hmm. I'm just not near big enough for chickens, so. You know. Well, that's good. That's great. Uh, I, I love to hear where, where people make it work. And, and it's, uh, I always, I, when I worked at the grocery store, I was always really excited about our turkey season, like going to get the turkeys from the farm. We worked with Cobblestone Valley, and we would go every year. That's another one of these places where people are trying to make that connection, and I think the holidays are a really great opportunity to do that. Um, and I just think it's cool when, when I am able to help people get products for their holiday celebration. So, like, you know, I see a local turkey on the table. I always think that's a really cool thing uh, and, and something you could promote. So I'm, I'm glad that, that uh, you were able to, to grab one of those. That's good. Uh, so for promotion, these are some of the things that you might want to have on your table. Business cards are the first one. You really want to make sure that you have your business card uh, to give to any potential buyers, even the customers. Sometimes customers just want to visit your farm, uh, whatever it might, you know, if, if you guys do that sort of thing, not everybody does. Now, you see, I have recipe cards on the top. That does not necessarily mean I think it's the best promotional tool. I think recipe cards work for some people, but not others. So don't spend a lot of money on recipe cards if you don't think that it's a fit for you. So one example of, of somebody, or a couple recipe cards that I thought worked really well. One was a pasta maker. He makes 70 or 80 different varieties of flavored cut, cuts of pasta. So whenever you, so people would come up, we have all the boxes laid out in front of us, and we would sell it by weight. So you'd say, I'll take a half a pound of this, a full pound of this, whatever it might be. And then when we would pack it, each flavor had its own recipe card that would get slipped into the bag. It's a little bit extra work, 
uh, it's actually a lot of work to produce all the recipes in advance, but because there were so many of them and they were dedicated to specific flavors, what we would find is we had some customers that tried to collect them all. So we, I mean, I literally, we'd have, uh, we had a couple of customers that had binders, and they would come in and say, oh, I've already had that one, I've already had that one, and try and collect them all. So that was an instance where recipe cards worked really well. Um, another one that I think works well, and is typically for, uh, like, meat producers, is if you sell to a restaurant, have that restaurant produce a recipe for you that you give out at the market. So it could be for, you know, maybe you have a cut of meat that you're having trouble selling. Um, I know flank steak and skirt steak didn't used to sell that well, but they're, they're getting to sell a little bit better. Is to have the, the restaurant you work with say, hey, could you come up with a simple five ingredient recipe for flank steak or whatever other specific thing you're trying to sell and we're going to put your logo on the recipe card too, and then people will know that they can come to your restaurant and get our and get your goods. So one that did it, they had they only offered four different recipes all season, and they just rotated them, and they were from four different restaurants, and they all said that it increased the amount of food that they sold at the restaurant. So here, the recipe card was partly to teach their customers an easy way to use a product they were having trouble selling, but it also promoted one of their partners and actually drove a little bit of their wholesale business. Um, so that's a good use of recipe cards. If you have something where you feel like people are, are coming in and it's a very versatile product, you know, jams and jellies can be used in a lot of different things. Salsa is an example where people will give you a million different ways to use salsa. Um, but I think with, with meats, to sell weird cuts, that's a really weird, uh, a really easy way to go. Uh, and again, promotes your, your partners. The flyers and brochures about your farm and where else you sell, they're very common. Uh, they tend to be a little expensive. Brochures can cost you, if you're doing a nice color brochure, they might be $250. Um, if you're printing them at home, maybe you're saving money, but you've got to do all the folding. Uh, that's one of my least favorite tasks is folding brochures. Unless you have some like really good actionable item in your brochure, I don't think it works for a lot of people, except for maybe just in that wholesale bag. So it, it goes into the wholesale sell, but to customers, giving a customer a $2 brochure, you know, they're going to keep it for a day, throw it out. It's not going to sit around uh, and, and get a bunch of people saying, wow, look at this brochure. We're going to go check out this farm. Um, they tend to be a little less effective, but you'll see them a lot of places. And so I really focus on just giving those potential wholesale accounts, unless you'll see on the bottom here CSA info. If you run a community-supported agriculture program, a share program, or are providing food for a share program, then I recommend giving out your brochure a lot. Um, are any of the, the farmers that we've got in the room, or are anybody either selling through their own CSA or through someone else's CSA? Nobody yet? Uh, I'll take just, just two quick minutes to talk a little bit about CSA because it's a really fast-growing model. Uh, farmers markets are, there's a, somewhere around 8,000, give or take 500, farmers markets in the country. Uh, so there's a, about one for every county. They're not spaced out that way, but that's about how the, the numbers work out. There are twice as many CSA programs in the country. So a CSA program is where a consumer buys a full share of produce at the beginning of the season, and then every week the farmer delivers a box of whatever is in season. The customers don't typically choose. You just, if you have, if only thing you have in season because it's early is lettuce and some greens, that's all they get. And then later in the season, they might, you know, get all the tomatoes and the fruit and all the other things that come in season. So a lot of farmers are starting CSA program so that they can get paid before the season starts, a flat sum, and then delivering every week. And then they're using the farmer's market to get customers for their CSA. And then also, potentially, as a pickup point. So people, you know, usually you will deliver to one spot. So like 
uh, CSAs that I've done through the years, I've picked up at a neighbor's house. Uh, they would just get dropped off on the porch. I'd go up to the porch and grab my box. Uh, a local coffee shop. And then I've also done one, and I recommend this to a lot of people, is at the farmer's market. So every week going to the farmer's market, instead of picking and choosing and buying you know, whatever there is, I just pick up the box of food that I've already paid for. Uh, and then oftentimes those people will buy other things off the table as well. Or they'll see what's in their box and say, okay, you know, I've got kale, chard, I really need some cooking oil. That guy's got the local uh, butternut squash oil or butter or whatever it is. So it'll actually drive traffic. I know it seems counterintuitive, but it'll actually drive traffic and spending to the farmer's market to run a CSA program. So for you folks that are doing meat, it's, it's not just uh, fruits and veggies that are doing it now. Meat people are doing them as well. Every week you get a, a certain amount of meat. You don't necessarily get to pick the cuts. Again, this is a good way to get rid of odd cuts. Uh, and they also are teaming with existing vegetable CSAs. So you find somebody in your local area, they're selling a CSA, and you, and you can approach them and say, hey, would you be interested in selling a meat share where I'll provide the meat to your customers that are doing the CSA, doing your veggie CSA, and people can add it on. Eggs are a very common add-on. Um, and the advantage to you is you sell it all at the beginning of the year. So at the beginning of the season, when you're spending all your money on seeds and fertilizers and pesticides and out in the you know breaking ground every year when you've got your most expense, you get paid up front. And then if you have them pick up at the farmer's markets, it's going to drive traffic there. So I do encourage those. If anybody's curious about CSA, you'll have my contact information. I could give you more information later. Um, one of the other things for promotions that I really like is a little card that just tells people everywhere your products are available. Again, it seems a little counterintuitive. You're at the farmer's market. You want to sell at the market full retail. But in every instance where I've worked with people that sold at the farmer's market and sold wholesale in other places around the community, their sales went up at both. So don't feel like you're sending business away by giving them a card that says, well, we also sell at the grocery store down here. They're still going to come to you. People get really set in their grocery habits and how they do their shopping. You know, When I was a kid, we went every Tuesday, or every other Tuesday, I should say, and we always read the labels for the price per ounce. Like we had really specific things. We did it every time, and people still do that. It's just now that they're shaping that around their farmer's market experience. So they're going to the farmer's market on Saturday or Thursday or whenever your market is, and then doing fill-in buying at the grocery store afterwards. So you have your market on Saturday. Uh, they 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 buy whatever it is they're going to buy from you. It turns out they really loved one of the things that they bought from you, and they ate it all right away, and they want more. They can also buy it on Tuesday. People will make the effort to buy it directly from you whenever they can, but also promote the places where they can buy it elsewhere. It's also going to give you better partnerships with your, your wholesale uh, accounts. Um, and then the last is I see a lot of farmers uh, per, like giving to events. Uh, the Rotary Club is having a breakfast and they're donating ingredients. Or there's a farm to table dinner and maybe you know it's one of those like $50 a plate dinners and they're serving some of the ingredients at it. Wherever there's an opportunity like that where you are engaged with your community and doing something that is a little bigger than just uh, you know growing, you know making and selling food where you're doing something that's supporting a larger cause, make sure to promote it. Um, you know, not to sound like a shill, but you should get some extra value out of that as well. And again, when we when we talk about these relationship-based purchases that people are making, they want to see that you're supporting the community. So whenever you do, don't be afraid of tooting your own horn. And it could just be as simple as saying, "Hey, you guys are having that event. Do you have any flyers? I would love to put out flyers at my my booth. They're gonna love it." You'll have a little talking point, some of those probing questions, some of those ways you'll get to know your customers. This is a great way to do it, and it does a really nice job of promoting you guys. Um, so again, we're, we're at the end of the slide, so I'm wondering what are some either some materials that you guys have handed out at your table that have been a good way to promote your, your farm, your company, 
um, or just like maybe some events, like we talked about the events, so there's some things that you guys have taken part in that you thought have really benefited uh, your brand and growing your business. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the next. So display building. This is, this is what it comes down to for, for most of this stuff, right? This is the big one, how to make your table look great. There are five distinct things you want to look at. So these are the basic principles of having a great display. You want to get the product up off of the table. I think this is the first mistake that I see, the, most off, the, the mistake I see most often, is people just laying the product down on the table and leaving it at that. You want to find ways to build some height as well as some depth into your, your booth. And so we're going to look at some pictures of good displays and how people have been able to do that. But the very first thing is, and now when I do this, again, when I do it in the classroom, I will I take my pocket knife out of my pocket and just lay it on the table in front of me and then ask the person farthest back in the room if they can see what I put on the table. Uh, then I will put a milk crate up on the table, open the knife, jam it in there, and then ask if they can see what it is. It's very simple. If you get the stuff up off the table and closer to eye level, people are more likely to see what you've got there. It looks more engaging uh, and people really want to come over and, and get to it. Depth is another one. So, uh, you know, lowest stuff at the front, highest stuff in the back, but to find ways to build both height and depth. Um, and when we're going to talk about some of the materials that you can use to, to do that. Uh, signage, again, we talked about a great length, but having good signage on your table is vital. Uh, if you have one product that you sell, you know, maybe, I, I usually tell people have a sign on either side of the table. With meat, uh, something that's really common is people will do a whiteboard or a chalkboard, and so that way if they sell out of stuff, uh, some people erase it. I prefer crossing it out. I like the people to see, people really love the, the sense of things being limited. It's a, it's a crazy thing. I talked about it, if anybody took the selling workshop, but, um, the, the idea of things being in limited availability or they missed out makes people want it more. Uh, every major restaurant and uh, even the fast food places do secret menus now. So you can go on and, and search online for secret Starbucks drink and then you can go in and order things that aren't on the menu and people think it's the greatest thing ever. So if you use a chalkboard to tell people what's available every week, I, I tell folks don't erase it, cross it out so that they know you had it and that they didn't come early enough. You will see people come earlier uh, to, to come and, and do that. Um, so signage can also include, and especially I'm thinking about folks that have to keep their product refrigerated and off the table, pictures of your farm or your production. And we're going to look at some examples of that too. But you know, uh, they make those digital picture frames where it'll just rotate through a bunch of pictures. I use my iPad at markets where I feel like it's, it's protected enough. I didn't do that in Brooklyn and Manhattan because somebody will run away with it. Um, but just pick, even just old school pictures and frames placed all over the table is a way to kind of connect people with, with what you do. Um, the meat folks, the, the people that have to have products that are refrigerated, that is probably your biggest obstacle is like how do you make your table look full? Uh, Pictures are a really easy way to do that. Uh, shopability. This is that you want people to be able to go engage with your, your displays without destroying it and also be able to pay you clearly. So we'll look at some, a really good shoppable display, but two examples that I've seen of really unshoppable displays or, or displays that made it difficult for people. One was there was a, it's, it's a farmer at a, an upstate farmer's market that their booth is beautiful. It's stacked as high as they can get it all the way around. No matter where you are in the farmer's market, you can see their display. And I remember walking up to it being like, wow, that is beautiful. The hand stacked everything beautifully. It was like a piece of art. And then I saw a customer who didn't want to buy the beets that were on the top of the display and wanted to get some beets that were in the middle of the display. So they did, and the whole thing came down on them. That's not a shoppable display. I think it goes without saying. Uh, 
but you want so you want to make sure that people can get products off of your your table without destroying everything that's there. The other one is color breaks. A really obvious place where I see people mix this up or, or they think they're doing the right thing is with green. Uh, you know, we're, we, are, we all have a tendency to put like things together to try to organize them all. So if you go to the grocery store and you're looking for potatoes, all of the potatoes are in one spot. If you're looking for greens, they're all in one spot. But with some items, if their colors are very similar and they're side by side, you're dealing with customers that are kind of walking past and casually looking at what you have. And when all of the colors are, are bunched together, they kind of lose track of what it is that's actually there. So while when you hold kale in one hand and chard in the other, they look very different, or lettuce and spinach, you, they're very easy to tell apart. When they're sitting on a table all side by side, they just look like a big green leafy mass. So you want to make sure that you break them up. So we're going to look at, so why don't we start by looking at uh, a picture of a display that has good color breaks so you can so this is an example that I think of really good color breaks. So uh, if you look on either end of the display, there are greens. So they, they found a way to break them up. They've got the lettuce on one side and the chard on the other one, and, and they've separated them. Uh, and they've done that by building good barriers with carrots and beets and, and cucumbers. Ultimately, you're looking at like a a six to ten foot display anyway. So it's okay to not have the peppers next to the peppers and the, the leafy greens next to the leafy greens. It's more about keeping those colors separated. One of the nice things that they've also been able to do here that I really like is they built the height and the depth while keeping it shoppable. So if we look at the cucumbers, this is a really great example, is they, they built in the height and the depth by using multiple baskets. So now people can still shop these cucumbers easily without pulling the whole display down. They've accomplished that a little bit with the beets here in that they made some beets of, you know, available towards the front. You can't shop every single piece of product on this table as easily as others, but, but still pretty, you know, you could still have some choice. Um, so this is a really a really great version of color breaks. And one of the other things that I like, and I heard I mentioned there was mentioned that somebody does flowers, uh, cut flowers, and and uh, things like that. Although I think you said farm stand for you guys. But if there is a if you feel like your booth doesn't have enough color, buy a bunch of flowers in the morning from one of the other vendors. If the vendor that happens to be in the room you see at the market, go buy flowers from them, and just put them on the table as an accent. If people want to buy them and you want to resell them at whatever you just bought them for, that's great. If you want to just send them down the way and say, hey, I got these, these beautiful flowers from somebody down there, it's a nice way to add color and to add some color breaks. So we'll come back to this one in just a second here. So again, these are the, the, the big five of building a great display. Height, depth, good clean signage, shoppability, and color breaks. So some of the materials that you'll want to build these things, keep it easy. I think baskets, boxes, uh, milk crates are very common. Any kind of cover for your displays. So an old dirty milk crate isn't a great display necessarily, but as we saw with the mushrooms earlier, you could put some colored fabric on the inside of it to cover it so it doesn't look so banged up and, and it makes it look a little more beautiful. Uh, I like just good old-fashioned bricks and two-by-fours. Uh, I've built nice displays out of that. Um, another common one that I do is the boxes that the product comes in. So if we, look, if we move one forward here. So this is a display of pickles and, and chutneys and some things of, with a company that I worked with. This particular booth at this market, they would give me two standalone side-by-side -side tent spaces. So that would mean that my booth actually had 40 feet of display all around it. And again, I try to add, so I had to bring enough product to fill the 40 feet, uh, as, as well as 
So what I do here is I put down the butcher paper, and then I build the displays out of the boxes that the product came in. It's very simple. It, I know it doesn't have a lot of color of its own, but it allows the colors of the product to really jump off the table. And this is actually the display that I get the most positive feedback from. Uh, people like that it's disposable and recyclable. Uh, and you'll see now, in this case, you don't see any signs hanging. What I've actually done here is I write the prices onto the butcher paper. So right at the bottom there, that's a little pepper. So any of the spiced products get a hot pepper. And then all the price points right down on there too. And you can see, you can see I've got sampling out just open jars with spoons in it. That gets a little messy. Uh, sometimes during the day, I'll lay a fresh piece of paper down across the front and re-sign it if I'm having a slow moment. You know, sometimes markets have little dead moments. Um, so this is a display where I, I've separated the colors to the best of my ability, uh, I've, and I've made do with what I've got. I really like display materials that pack into themselves. I think that's a really, uh, a, a really efficient way to build things. So table covers we talked a little bit about, display covers we talked a little bit about. For folks, again, accents, that's about adding a little color to a table that maybe doesn't have a little bit on its own. Uh, and then the brick boards and center blocks, people like rust. So baskets, uh, wooden crates, but even just blocks and boards, people like to see that you'll see you know, retailers you see doing that all the time. They're having a more rustic look inside, and they're building displays out of pallets and things like that. You can have that kind of feel at your market, too, and people really respond to it. Now, I know somebody in the room hopefully is thinking, why would you drag a cinder block to build a display out of? The reason I do that is for windy days at the market, sometimes you need a little extra weight to hold your tent down. So I bring the cinder block as weight. And if it doesn't happen that I would need them that day, I put them on the table and build them like that. Um, so before we start looking at some pictures of more displays, are there any display materials that you guys have really liked that you think do well for you? <laughs> All right. Um, so meat. So meat is one that is typically difficult to display. And so one of the things that people do is uh, actually get, if you have a market where there is power, is to have a little refrigerator on your table, a little freezer on your table with a glass door. Uh, there's a, a fish farmer that I work with, he does tilapia, that he distills a really small little whole box with a, a plastic lid on the top, and he puts the, the fish that are wrapped and sealed on ice in the display, and he built a really cheap, small, cool, cold box. Again, you're going to want to talk to your market if they're comfortable with that, but typically if you can keep the temperature cold enough, folks won't have trouble with that. Uh, so let's take a look at some... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. come on up to the mic. Did I see a question there? Yeah. We sell our turkeys, and, uh, of course, you can't really display a turkey, so we have them in the freezer boxes or either fresh or frozen. And I use the pictures. I take pictures of the turkeys out on the open range and, and in their coops and I have a display board of those, and I also, I think most comments I get are in the picture of the roasted turkey that I have from the previous Thanksgiving sitting there. I, that seems to draw more people's attention to the booth than any of the pictures. But my question was for sampling. You can't roast a turkey every time you go to the farmer's market. <laughs> But we do, whenever we have a turkey that has broken wing or the skin doesn't look perfect for roasting, we have them ground up into turkey, um, like ground beef, ground turkey. Would it be 
permissible to use that as a sampling. It's not your current product, but it's, a, I mean, it's one of the turkeys. Could you right. that and use that as a sampling, or is that being deceitful because it's not one of the birds in the... In the I think so. Turning meat is always going to be a tricky thing. So you want to make sure that just in general, the market that you're at is going to allow you to serve cooked meat. And if they do, I think ground turkey is fine. You know, it's still the, the birds you're serving. And I think people will understand you to say, hey, you know, we're not able to roast a turkey every time we come out here. But what we've been able to do so you can get a taste is get some ground. And I think that's okay. I don't think anybody will be able with that. Okay. Because we don't really sound the ground turkey, but... but you know what might end up happening is, is you might get a lot of requests for it if you're sampling out. So it might be that you can end up having a secondary product later. Uh, but if you don't sell it now, I think people will be fine with that. That's not a big deal. Um, the one thing that might happen is you just might start getting a lot of requests for it, which isn't a bad thing. Okay. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have some questions that, about their displays specifically before we start looking at some uh, pictures of displays? Yeah, a quick one. Um, the stuff that I'm doing, it has a, uh, an overhang or, an, or a, an awning that's open on three sides. And so I'd be setting up more than just a single table. So I'm wondering, what, do you have any recommendations on how best to set up a display that has multiple fronts or multiple tables? So I think if I, if I heard right, you've got the, it's open on the side, so you have tables all the way around you, and you want to make sure that, you want to see how to just make displays that accommodate all of those sides? Yeah, I've, I've got more flexibility than just having a single front for the, I've got more flexibility than just having a single table up front. I mean, I can design it any way. I was wondering if you had any recommendations on how best to do that. Sorry, I'm a little trouble. So I want to have more than one table. Yes. Okay. So it depends on how traffic moves through the market. So if you notice, you know, a lot of markets, people will stay on one side and then they come around and everybody moves in one direction around. So if you happen to be in a market that does that, you want to highlight the display that's facing towards the traffic that's coming. Um, one of the other things that I've done, so I, I do displays like that, and I might only use the front half of those side tables, and so I'm still building towards the front, but I, and then the back half of those tables are tall, and then I have other things behind them. I have my samples, I have my cleaning materials, so I'm still getting the extra depth back. Um, I'm not sure that this is probably like, what, what is the product that you're selling? Uh, it'll be everything from fruits, vegetables, uh, bedding plants, honey, maple, um, barbecue, smoking woods, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, so, the other thing that I would probably go with the, the stuff that's in the back that maybe people don't want to handle as much. So a potted plant, they might not necessarily be as interested in grabbing as vegetables. Like people want to you know, look over the vegetables, make sure they got the most perfect heat that they've ever grown. So stuff that they want to engage, you want to make easiest for them to get to. The stuff that, like the potted plants again, like stuff that's uh, it's a good display item, you might want to go high uh, towards the back of it. And again, you know, think about how people are moving towards your booth, so that if they're always coming from one direction, make sure that the most beautiful display you have faces in that direction. You know, not everybody's going to come to your booth straight on, and so if you're talking about a booth where you're showing displays on the side, really focus on where folks are coming from, and that's your like A plus display. That's your best one. Thank you. The other thing that you're the other thing you're going to want to do is if you have displays that get really high around you or kind of isolate you, is to leave some good open space. 
So let's take a look at one. So this is a booth where I think they do a good job going really high around them, but still leaving it open in the middle. So this is usually my big finish, because I think that this is about as perfect the farmer's market as you can build. Now, you know, maybe they could have done something different with the, fa the fabric to be less busy. Um, one of their challenges is that they have perishable product, it's all the same color. So in this instance, each cheese has its own basket. There's a cool pack under the pit, so the cheeses are actually staying refrigerated in the basket. And then to add a little flat color to let people know they're different cheeses, they do colored signs. Their signs can definitely be more legible, but they've at least found some ways to, to kind of add a little flat color to it. My favorite part of this, well, my second favorite part of this display is that Meg is available at the bill here to engage with her customers. So, so the, big, the important thing to think about as you build your display is that you can still get your customers comfortable. One of my first days at the market, I built this really tall display all the way around, and then I had to get a short customer chain and knock a bunch of stuff. So they accomplished that by just making this little space in the middle. Now, if you look to her left, it's empty right now, but you'll see the little red patch. That is their sample dome. So pretty much all the display materials on their booth are beige or green. But they really want to draw your eye to cheese samples. So they've added this red piece of cloth there in the middle where she's going to engage with you, where it's going to be kind of open to work. And then so I have already eaten all the cheese samples, obviously. Um, now, while we're looking at this, can any of you figure out what my favorite part of this display is? It's the thing that does the most work for her, drives the most traffic. Chalkboard. We've had a chalkboard and cows in the back. Those are both very good, but there is... I'm going to probably say her smile. That's it. Her smile. People want to come and talk to Meg at her booth. Even when she's having a tough day and she's been milking cows at 4 in the morning before she comes to the market, she brings her game face. She's always smiling at people, and it does make a huge difference. Now, you did mention two other things that I think are really important, too. Cows in the back. So these are her cows, but they could just as easily be any cows in there. Uh, and they got these printed at Staples really cheaply. Now, since we're talking about those nice little posters, I have to mention because Meg brought it up to me. She cleans the back of her truck. There are no more rough days. She, if she saw that I was using the shirt, she was like, I'm so embarrassed about the rust. So she cleaned it up, and now you all know she would never bring her truck to the market like that. Uh, now, you also mentioned the chalkboard. On the chalkboard it says, ask about milk share. And so what they do is, I mentioned PSA earlier, they offer a share of milk. At the beginning of the month, you can buy a single milk share. And then every week, you come to the market and pick it up. So they have a really limited amount of fluid milk that they produce. And this is a way for them to sell it and also to get people to come to the booth every single week. So people bought the share, they come to get their milk, and then they buy yogurt and cheese while they're there. It's been a nice little way for them to drive traffic, and it also was a little less risky for them since they did such little fluid milk. All their fluid milk so they, they do a nice job with the chalkboard. Uh, the yogurts that you see up on the top of the shelf there are empty. They're just display. So if you have products that you can with, just show the package. Get it out of the refrigerator. 
people. Uh, besides the, the cows in the back, they also have a picture frame over to her right that is pictures of the family. Um, and so if you're going to have pictures, the two things people respond most to are animals and sheep. So if you can show pictures of you making your product, working in the field, that's great. Uh, and the, the animals, obviously, sometimes I've had people say, oh, well, if I have a picture of my cow and I'm selling steak, people get squeamish. That's not really how it used to get more. Uh, so, so you don't have to worry so much about that. But really, you, your family, the people working on your farm, and the animals. Those are the big ones to get pictures up on your display. So here's another display. Uh, now, this is not at a farmer's market specifically. You should never just put baked goods out into the open air like this. But there's so many good elements to this display that I like to use this one anyway. So all of the materials that you see on the table here cost them less than $40. They have fat that they bought at the dollar store. Uh, and you'll see they find different ways to make some different depths by turning some of them over, standing some of them up. Uh, they've also done a nice job building some height in the back with a crate. Uh, they've got the chalkboard to let people put flavors because it changes every week. Again, that was a dollar store purchase. And then over to the, the side, you'll see that there are displays on pieces of wood. They had a tree fall down in their front yard. And one of them just cut up the slab and finished it. And so now they've built these really nice displays that add texture, height, depth, and the whole thing packed into the crate. So while they've got that crate there, everything can pack into it. So they can actually walk out with all of their materials in one spot. I, that's something I really like about it. Now, they also have a campus in that everything's the same color. So they bought a couple of 50-cent pie pumpkins uh, to add a little bit of splash on the table. Again, that could be a cup cut flowers. You cut flowers from your front yard. But they were able to, to build something really cheap, really elegant, and really efficient in that it packs the way it fits all of their um, are there any of the, the four displays that we looked at that you want to look at a little more in depth? Are there any specific display questions about your products that you'd like to ask? Yeah. Where do you find the butcher paper? I get this at uh, either, I, I used to get it at my butcher shop because they just, I saw they had it in the back and so they sold me some. You can also get it at Restaurant Supply or any packing material supply company. So Office Depot, you just go with the mailing supplies and they sell it for like two bucks. If you can get the actual butcher paper, you can get a bigger roll. But if you have to go to like UPS stores, Staples, any of those kinds of places, it's still really cheap. It's just like packaging paper. Any others? Do you have any? So this is the end of the, the slideshow. So are there questions that we didn't get to that you had? Yes, I got one. Okay, just All right. yeah, one question, Marty. Sure. Marty, how you doing, big guy? I'm doing it. I'm good, man. How are you? Good. Um, how do you go about pricing items wholesale as opposed to uh, regular resale? Is there like a general rule? Uh, what, what sort of product do you sell? It's it's going to be a pack of fiber products. Great. Um, I'm glad you came up there because I also meant to mention um, the display stuff for you guys. Think about how like if at any clothing or anything like that, like socks. I know a lot of people do socks and sweaters when they do fiber. Uh, mannequin displays, the mannequin feet. So keep that in mind as you're building your display. So for, for pricing, you know, you can look around and see what other people are selling 
they're good for. They're, you know, there's a lot more fiber markets out there, so you can figure out retail, I'm guessing, pretty easily. Okay. Most, yeah, so the most wholesale for fiber goods, uh, it's half of retail. That's very, that's most of them. That's what I would shoot for. If that price doesn't work for you, you can negotiate something differently with people. But that's what most places are going to ask. They're going to want to double the price. Now, when they buy it at wholesale, you want them to buy a minimum amount. So you don't give them a wholesale price for two. You give them a wholesale price for 12 or 24, whatever the minimum is. So the advantage to you is sell pulse. Yes, I got half price, but I sold 25 of them. Yeah. Understood. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Um, oh, and, and one other thing I want to mention to you, uh, a lot of people are doing kind of the agro-tourism thing. People love visiting alpacas. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. That's going to be an advantage for us, yeah. Yeah, because we'll, be, we'll actually be um, – any store out in Mayville that'll have um, um, an area actually where I can pen one in, a couple of them in, and they'll actually be on the display. Um, display. So, and then we'll have a sign in back, you know, and the store will be inside. So, it's kind of a good advantage for us. One of the things that I, I've seen some good markets do. Not everybody can do it. There's regulations about animals and stuff, but sometimes markets will have like a day where you can bring, like they'll have one producer bring one animal? Yes. So uh, you're not probably going to bring a cow. That's kind of a big a big obligation. Uh, but some, I've seen alpacas at farmer's markets where people brought it because they have the big trailer and sometimes they bring them around. That's like an event for the market. You know what I mean? It's like the whole market can promote. Yeah, and, and it, also, it also helps the other people out too. They kind of appreciate absolutely. it. So. Yeah. As long as you clean up after them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and I, I saw that there was honey, that somebody brought honey. I, I've also seen uh, hives or combs that are in, like, a glass display where the bees are in the display. Do you, you know, have you ever seen one of those? That, if, if whoever has honey has a way that they can actually build a little mobile hive or honeycomb, uh, kids love it. It scares the heck out of them, and they are just fascinated by it. Uh, so anytime you can, like, th those are ways that really spice up your display. <coughs> Bringing a, a goat to the market will spice up your display. Uh, and speaking of kids, anything you can do to make your booth kid-friendly will make your display a hit at the market. So uh, coloring books. Displays that are down low enough, like maybe in the corners, where it's actually real down low and kids can engage with it. Um, name the animal contest. So, you know, if chickens or cows, like maybe you've named them all, but there's a new calf. Uh, you, you know, you could actually have kids name the animal, take a picture of it, bring it to the market, say, help us name our new calf. That's something that, the, again, will drive a little traffic to the market, will drive a little traffic to your booth, and the market overall to promote it, being like, we have an animal naming contest today. Uh, and so that's another way to kind of engage kids. The coloring books, uh, Organic Valley, uh, often will make them free. You can just call Organic Valley and say, oh, we're having an event, and we'd love to be able to give out some of your coloring books, and they'll send you 20. Uh, in like those little three packs of crayons. And so maybe it's not your product, but parents will appreciate that you're engaging their kids, teaching them about the farm, teaching them about where, where food comes from, um, any little things that you can do like that. Anything you can do to make your booth kid friendly. A face painter, uh, a balloon animal artist. I've seen farmers that say, hey, you know what, we'll all go in and we'll spend two bucks a piece or whatever to hire a face painter. Uh, that's a great way to engage kids at the market. Um, and that's something that it, you don't have to be a market manager. Like you can, it, you can ask your market if that's something they'd be willing to do. Um, and and if, if it happens to you, you want to pay for the whole thing so that it's at your booth, 
you know, maybe that's a way that you can promote it too. But kid friendly will get you long term customers for sure. Any other questions or comments about anything at all? Well, then that's all I've got for you. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Marty. That concludes the program. Uh, if you did the survey, that would be wonderful. You could either just leave it up right here. And then, since I don't do anything with the registrations and stuff, those are usually handled through Natalie in uh, JCC. The people that have to get the information from today, the Zolanders and Alan, can I, I just can I get your date of birth sure. also for that? Because um, I'll eat that. <laughs> Yeah. Old enough to know well, that. Yeah. 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 We will also have the uh, presentation and, and slides available uh, after we get it um, processed for everyone. We'll, we'll email you that. So, okay, Marty, with that, we'll bid you adieu. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much.